Hi, this is Trev, and welcome to my blog. Welcome to part two, part three, part four, part five, part six, part seven, part eight, part nine, part ten, part eleven, part twelve, part thirteen, part fourteen, part fifteen, part sixteen, part seventeen, part eighteen, part nineteen, part twenty! The final part of my Bedford CA van restoration. We're right where we left you, part 19. I've just refitted the anti-roll bar with some new bushes and I've just fitted a pair of brand new front shock absorbers. So this is as far along the line as I can go with the mechanical for now. Let's turn our attention to something else. Let's start making this van look really pretty. I've decided to epoxy prime the shell in four stages. The two core panels, the roof and then the inside. I've attacked it with everything I've got to get rid of every last rust spot and it's come out really well. It hasn't been painted before. I'm the second person to have painted this van bar a couple of little bodge ups around the wheel arches. So uh, this steel hasn't seen the light of day since 1960 and uh, it's come out really well. It's very very solid. Mega masking job because what I don't want to do is cover all the uh, work I've already done in overspray. Now that the van shell is completely epoxy primed, ready for the filler, I'm going to turn my attention to the rest of the panels that still haven't been repaired yet. So first thing I'm going to do is address this front panel. This front panel is the original one off the van and it is completely rotten. It is slightly different however to the replacement panel around the grille area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the grille area from the original front panel into the new one and make a few small repairs around the headlight panels. All of the metalwork repairs on the front panel, the wings, the doors, making up the rear wheel boxes, all of these feature heavily upon my tips and tricks videos. If you'd like to see those in greater detail, then you can just go to my videos, scroll through and find the appropriate video. I'm only going to give you an overview in this because the video would be 10 hours long if I went through everything in its entirety. The original front wings were really, really rusty as you can see and unfortunately I bought a set of replacement wings but they turned out to be as rusty as the original ones. Anyway, I was really fortunate because when I bought the front panel, which was a bit of a trek all the way down to Bournemouth, but well worth it, that front panel came with a pair of front wings as well, which turned out to be pretty good actually. Probably the best I was likely to find anyway. The front door repairs were minimal, needing nothing more than a tiny plate welding in the bottom, lots of filler repairs because they were very battered and bruised. The rear doors were a different matter, although they weren't too badly rusted, the main problem I had with the rear doors is there was no check strap on the rear doors and it was obvious that the doors had been allowed to open up and fold around the hinges meaning that it had actually split the door skin. What somebody had done is pop riveted a plate over the top to act as some kind of strengthener. So what I had to do with the rear doors is remove the section of skin around the hinge and replace it with some good metal. Also had to repair the strengthener on the inside with the threaded captive part needing to be welded back to the door frame. The rear wheel boxes had suffered considerable corrosion but due to the complex shape and relatively small size, 
I decided the best course of action would be to completely scrap them and build a brand new pair. The video clips you are viewing now come from a video where I show you their complete manufacture, featured in my tips and tricks videos, distortion free bead rolling. Massive thanks to Steve Gowing at Race and Restoration for the loan of the metalworking equipment. With all the metalwork now finally complete, I epoxy primed all those panels and then it was time to put a couple of months into filler work to get everything looking lovely and flat before I 2K primed the whole van.
Finally got the shower primer today. Seems to have taken absolutely ages. I've been doing lots of filler work, of course, making my way around the van, but I've just finally got the primer on the shell now, so I thought I'd just take a quick video of it. Roof next. I'm gonna lower it down onto wooden blocks. This is a bit too high. I'll be able to reach the roof. There isn't too much to do on the roof. Every panel is now primed. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna fit up the entire van. So all the body panels are gonna be bolted back onto the van to check for final fitment and any holes that need to be drilled or little things that need to be fitted like this charging port for sat nav etc I'll have to do all that get all that fitted now before I start painting another marathon masking job all this just to paint the dashboard So that's the inside of the van painted. I'm gonna do a two-tone paint job. I did neglect to video much of the paintwork itself for a variety of reasons, including not wanting to get overspray all over my camera and that ruined. Also, I was extremely pushed for time while I was painting the van and there was a certain sense of compelling urgency uh, around this time as well so I really didn't have too much time to do too much videoing but here's the few bits I managed to get in anyway seeing every square inch of the van painted it was finally time to put that van back together again and what a massive job that was the biggest jigsaw puzzle ever but how satisfying seeing all those pieces going together and standing back and looking at the finished results was absolutely fantastic another modification I really wanted to make was to the headlight surrounds and after much searching 
my answers came in the guise of these customised aftermarket Harley Davidson headlight surround extensions. So I bought these and I modified them to fit the Lucas lights uh, by welding some little brackets in. They're secured with a screw underneath, same as the Lucas ones are. I painted these in body colour because I wanted them in body colour because they will change the shape and the appearance of the front of the van. The chrome trim on the front of the van was in a really bad way and I found out that it's actually brass trim that's chrome plated. So I took the trim off and I spent a lot of time easing all the little dents out of it. I managed to source a new lower trim without any holes drilled in it and I sorted that one out as well and sent it off to a place called Broadway Brass for re-chroming. The guy was asking me at the NEC, he spotted that I'd made a cover-up for the ignition. He said, have you made a cover-up? I said, yes, I have. He said, oh, that looks really smart. I'd like to have seen that. So here you go. Bit of an interesting thing, this. I made the front up out of fiberglass. So it's fiberglass around that section there, and then the rest is made out of steel. And I did that because of the passive anti-theft system that's a coil that's mounted to the front of the barrel. And I wanted to make sure that that still worked. I wasn't sure whether it would work through steel or not, so I didn't risk it. I made it out of glass fibre instead. That sounded pretty positive. Once I got the van built up to the stage where all the panels were all bolted and opening and closing nicely, I decided to turn my attention to polishing the van before I fitted the final parts, like the headlamps and the indicators and things like that. So I flatted and polished the whole van all over, made a really nice job of it. I did do a very long video showing each part of the process. That's in my tips and tricks videos. The instrument binnacle. What a colossal adventure this turned out to be. But I got there in the end and I stuck to my original plan with using the original focus cluster and piggybacking off the back of the lights to the new LEDs that were mounted on the new binnacle. And one or two of them wouldn't work because the LED wasn't a big enough resistance and I actually had to fit a bulb in instead which threw me off a little bit for a short while anyway. And when I'd got it all wired in, I realised that this was going to be an enormous hassle. I actually set myself up for a bit of a fall, permanently wiring it in, even though I left the wiring a couple of feet long so I could get the binnacle right out of the way if I needed to get behind. But I soon realised that this was going to be pretty impractical if I really did have a big problem. So what I ended up doing is making up new looms and fitting some sockets and plugs off other vehicles, multi-pin ones. And I think it works really, really well. All the lights work I've actually had no breakdowns so far everything's been working really really well coffee machine installation time unless it's evaded your attention the van's actually going to be a mobile cafe believe it or not people have watched all 19 parts and then ask me hey Trev what are you going to do with your van when it's finished? Well, funnily enough, it's actually going to be a mobile cafe, guys. So here's the machine going in. Absolutely loved fitting this. Absolutely loved fitting my gas box as well, seeing it all painted inside with that brand new bottle in there, all the fixtures and fittings against it. Everything looks just so much nicer. Now it's painted and more finished off. Had to make a bracket up to hold the leisure battery because the coffee machine runs on LPG and electric. The LPG runs the element side, so it doesn't need much electricity to run all the solenoids and the valves and everything else that's associated 
with a coffee machine. So every year it has to be tested. This is the guy checking it over. This has to be annually, done annually, as I said, and you have to have this done. It's a requirement by law so that you can actually trade with the van serving coffee, doing events. It's one of these hoops you've got to jump through when you're in business. Here's witnessing the most expensive espresso ever made. One of the final build-up jobs was to fit this rubber matting in the floors. And can you believe it? Another mega masking job once again to finally rust proof the van. A little bit more rust proofing, wax oiling and under sealing went on after I'd of course applied all those epoxy products beforehand. I had these beautiful seat covers made up by a place called Halls Interiors, link in the video description. And all I did is I ripped the old seat cover off, sent it off to the guy, and then he used this as a pattern to make up a pair of these seat covers. And I couldn't have been happier with the results. And this is how the fuse box cover turned out. This was the fuse box cover I made out of an instrument binnacle cut down influenced heavily by Martin Campbell. Last but not least, the sign writing. Bit of a story attached to the name because we were originally going to be called Blue Birds Bakery. Blue Birds being two separate words. And the problem when you call a company a name is that you can actually start trading, have all your printed materials all printed out or invoices done all your packaging printed everything and then somebody can come along and say hey i own the property rights to that name or something a little bit similar that be could be mistaken for the same name and they can actually force you legally to change the name of your business imagine that having been established for say a year or something so we actually went for the intellectual property rights on the name Blue Birds Bakery and we were quickly apprehended by a solicitor who said that we were going to be sued if we progressed any longer. So we then changed the name to The Baking Bird and we secured the intellectual property rights on that and then had the sign writing done. These pictures were taken on the 5th of July 2014. I actually bought the van in February 2014 but the van had to sit there because I had various things to do including completely fitting out a kitchen before I could start the van but on the 5th of July that is when the van entered the garage and work commenced. This picture was taken on the 16th of December 2019 and it was on the 16th of December that I took the van for its first MOT bit of a frustration with this one because I couldn't actually drive the van to the test station for insurance reasons so rather frustratingly it had to be transported there and back home again and the MOT didn't appear live on the DocGov website for a few days which as you can imagine was quite frustrating but once it did I could then get on and tax the vehicle and I was legally allowed to drive it on the road for the first time. Yeah, it's weird, it's weird actually seeing it like this. Did you get generic rubber joiners for the panels or have you got the right ones for the job? So, they do the same in Italy, don't they? You can get stuff for old Italian. I'm guessing that the question that most people would like answering is Hey Trev, how well does the van go? Babylon is just a hundred on the dash 
quick flip, clutch quick, or this all could crash. I got the records that make up the map. Yeah, it goes all right. Let's take it out for a spin. Ready? We're ready. The sun is shining. We're ready. We picked up quite nicely. I can't believe we're actually driving it now. Where it's not, it's not piddling down the rain for a change. <laughs> so we're approaching. Approaching 40 now, this is a 50 road, but well, I don't really want to do 50. We're getting up to 40, I'm going to 50 now. Got to get at least to about 40 miles an hour before you get into 50. So I'm going to slow down and get into 40 because we've got a junction coming up here. Take the corner at third, just. Yes, we're all right. We're in third now. Put my foot down a little bit. dozens of questions put to us every single day when we're operating the van so I think it would be a good thing to answer some of these questions on this video but I need to go and get my wife Tracy before we answer these questions bit of preparation <laughs> so are you the bird I'm the bird <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the questions we were asked so are you the bird? <laughs> Which I think is brilliant, I love that. That's probably my best line yet that somebody said to me. <laughs> so we'll give you a bit of a, a candid answer to the questions that we keep being asked all the time. So what are the questions that we're being asked all the time? Do you go anywhere else? Hmm. So we get asked that a great deal because we were at the farm shop. Yes, we do do some different things, but they have to be quite special, don't they, Trace? Definitely. So we do a street market in Cheltenham, which is really lovely. We also did a wedding last year. We have another one booked for this year. 
We have an event booked at Gloucester Cathedral, which will be very, very special, I think, to do. That's the flower show, isn't the it? flower show, yeah, that's taking place in May. So we do go different places, but most of the time we are at the farm shop. Yeah. We like to be loyal yeah. to our customers as much it's, as we can. It's a balancing act, isn't it? Because we like to stay loyal to our customers that come regularly. So if we're not there, they often turn up if they don't see that we're not there on social media. And also um, it's nice to stay at a regular place, I think, isn't it? Definitely. As, as much as possible. Oh, you're Thanks very much. Yeah, so pretty. <laughs> Something else that is quite amusing, we find, although can be a little bit tedious at times, is people come in in waves, don't they? So we have like periods of say 20 minutes or something with hardly any customers, and then seven cars will enter the car park, and we can have a small queue accumulate quite quickly. And uh, what do people say when there's nobody? You must be going out of business. You must be going out of business, yeah. <laughs> How do you keep going? It suddenly gets busy and we can have a small queue. People say, um, oh, you must be doing all right because there's a queue of people. Yes, <laughs> coffee shop millionaires. <laughs> I wish. Yeah, so <laughs> in the course of 10 minutes, we can be going out of business and uh, you yeah. must be doing. Yeah, doing all right. You must be doing all right all in the space of 10 minutes. So what else do you do for the rest of the week? Oh, yeah, that's a little bit of a sore point for poor Tracy because the business ties you up for how many days a week? Six and a half. We're only trading for three days. It's the baking. The baking takes a lot, a lot more than I realised perhaps, but good. But yeah, it's my yeah. whole week is spent baking. It's spent baking, so yeah. Or sourcing ingredients. We've got very, very loyal customers that we'll be forever grateful for, won't we? They come every single week, whatever the weather, it can be minus five and they still turn up and have their cakes and coffee. Um, but that's amazing. They text you to make sure you got home in the snow, which is just incredible too. And I think another positive is as well, I mean, me, myself, I'm an incredibly shy person, as you probably know. <laughs> I definitely am. You're but, not. <laughs> Tracy, you would definitely, I don't think I'm overstepping the mark by saying that Tracy was, was, I hasten to add, an extremely shy person. Mm -hmm. And because I pretty much involved in just operating that coffee You've got machine. Your back to everybody. So I've got my back to everything. So the beauty looking forward and the beast looking backwards, which is just as well, really. So um, I'm cracking on making the drinks and Occasionally I'll, I'll tilt my head over and say hi to people if we're busy and you know I do love talking to people but the one positive thing that has come out of this is it's helped Tracy no end because she's literally <laughs> baptis <laughs> baptism of fire. You're just going to have to talk to these people and um, they make it easy though. Yeah very, very nice. and very very quickly Tracy is completely blossomed and come out of herself and you know we've made some nice friends. She, we've made some cracking friends with the business mm -hmm. and we see these people practically on a weekly basis and they come to get their through fix, lockdown they? they were kind of like our family because yeah. we couldn't see our own family no, and friends so no, they that's right. you know they kind of stepped into that place and it's carried on which is really really lovely that's one of the very very good positives of the business definitely 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 mm -hmm. We're a bit early, I'm afraid. If you could just give us 10 minutes to get the machine up to temperature, and we'll give you a cappuccino. <laughs> Inspiration. What made you think about doing a mobile cafe. Where did you first get the inspiration from? A Georgie Porgie Christmas pudding. A small little pudding and it was made by a guy called Georgie Porgie so I kind of thought well I need to buy that for our George and our George loved it. A little bit about Georgie Porgie very quickly. He was 15 years of age and he got himself a part-time job cleaning a kitchen and he asked the boss if he could borrow the oven to make some Christmas puddings 
and that's how it started. So from 15 years of age, I don't know how old he is now, but he's certainly old enough to have a family of his own and a big factory, lots of people working for him. And I think he said that he sold around 50,000 puddings last year or mm -hmm. something like that. It was a, a, a massive They are whack. very nice puddings. Yeah, they are very nice. So. <laughs> we told him kind of the story and since then we've got to know him a little bit more. We actually went to see him in Devon, didn't we, last year? Whereabouts is he in Devon? He's got a, a shop now. Budley Salterton. So he was kind of a little bit of an inspiration. He certainly was a big inspiration. Yeah. But he sort of planted the seed and I was desperate to leave the accident repair trade. Tracy was desperate to leave the dementia care. So she was looking after elderly people mostly. I thought, well, if we could make a cake shop, mobile cake shop, combine it with old vehicles, I think that was pretty much the start of it. Then of course you've got to have the coffee machine as well, otherwise it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. The great thing about it is, is you basically can make a sale ever so quickly. So if you're going to go from month to month before you actually earn any money, which has historically always been the way we've gone about it, it did appeal to me the fact that you can produce something, open up and within five minutes you've taken £20 uh, for a sale, you haven't got to wait till the end of the month to get paid. Everybody's really happy. Mm. Everyone enjoying the fair so far? Yay! Yeah, like it. This is one of the main things, really, got for me. In a cake, why wouldn't they be? Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. When you're repairing people's cars, everyone's miserable. Everyone's really fed up because to start with, their car's been damaged, so they're already upset. Mm. And, uh, and then it's always, of course, this issue with uh, getting paid and the person being happy with the job and how much they're paying. It's a complete nightmare. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is really great because, like I said, everybody actually wants to come and see you and they enjoy themselves and they enjoy what they have and they keep coming back and they're happy mm -hmm. and you don't have to wait a month to get paid. So this is the fantastic thing. When we first bought the van, we bumped into a, a lovely couple, Ashley and Kaylee, and they got a Volkswagen split screen. They were called the Split Screen Bakery, and they just started, so it's easy to look back at how they got started, how they bought their van, converted it into a coffee shop, and a really, really nice couple, easy to talk to, and um, they were a bit of not so much inspiration because we'd already started on the journey, but it was just nice to be able to look at someone else that was doing the same as us. Mm -hmm. And within a year, I think they probably... Their, their aim was always to yeah. scale up. The, and they've done it, haven't they? They've got a, a bagel shop, what bagel shops? So. Called the Steam House. I ran into Ash last year and it was completely bizarre, but we just ran into him and he did remember us, didn't he? Mm, yeah. And we were having a chat and anyway, he employs about 80 odd people now. Mm. And even in our local town, one's just opened. So yeah, fair play to them. Really pleased for them. The Volkswagen van still lives on. It was bought by a lovely lady called Jen and she now runs it as a business called the Split Screen Coffee Company. Trevor particularly gets um, the same thing said to him, not even a question really, it's more said to him as if he doesn't know what the van's all about. So what do they all say to you, Trevor? You wouldn't believe it, guys. I got a little story to tell you here. <laughs> this guy came over to me and he said, hey, that's a Bedford CA. I said, yeah, it is, mate. Yeah, I was so pleased he recognised the van. And then he said, uh, three speed, column change, yeah, that's right, buddy, yeah, yeah. Sliding doors, yeah, that's right, yeah. Anyway, about 10 minutes later, another guy came over and he said, that's a Bedford CA. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Three speed, column change, sliding doors. I was like, yeah, that's right, yeah, fantastic. And then five minutes later, another guy comes over. That's a Bedford CA. Three speed, column change, sliding doors. Another guy comes over. That's a Bedford CA. Three speed, column change, sliding door. Another guy comes over. That's a Bedford CA. Three speed, column change, sliding doors. Three speed, column change, sliding doors. Three speed, column change, sliding doors. And it suddenly made me think, I wonder if the whole world is just orchestrated.
Just in case there are some bedwetters still watching, that was in fact a smoke bomb with the burnout. I'm sure you probably already worked that out. Apologies to all the people that have been waiting for absolutely ages for part 20 to happen. I wanted the business to have some stability before I put 20 on. Kind of like a happily ever after video. Unfortunately, it's been super, super tough. Starting up a business in the middle of a pandemic and then we had the Brexit situation and all these things have a knock-on effect. I'll talk you through some of the detail of what's been happening with the business and how we've been doing, how we got started, how we nearly never got started. So of course, unless you have been living under a rock for the last few years, there was the COVID situation. And let me go back a little bit further before then. I talked in the video about being pressured to get in the van painted and finished. And this was because we'd actually booked our first event for Christmas Day 2019. We were actually due to appear at our local Lido to do a Christmas Day swim. So people swim across in freezing cold temperatures. And it was something that they would have liked to have had, our vintage coffee van. It absolutely bucketed down for weeks and weeks. So much so that the ground was completely waterlogged and there was no chance of getting the van in because we wouldn't get in, we wouldn't get back out again. The local council owned the car park and they wanted £150 for an application fee in order for us to apply for a licence to serve in the car park for one hour and then they were going to charge us for that licence afterwards. At which point we said, enough's enough. This is complete nonsense. We just knock it all on the head. We were extremely busy trying to book as many events that we could find through for the summer of 2020. And we were fairly well booked up. We pretty much had something going on every single week, which was fantastic. Then of course the COVID situation hit. Our first event that was canceled was in the March. We were gonna be at a tithe barn beautiful old barn. The event organisers said we're just going to plough on. We're just going to hold this event. Whatever happens we're holding this event and so just prepare for it. So we baked all the cakes in preparation for it and then uh, about four hours before the event was due to actually go ahead we had a last minute panicked message off the event organisers to say we're going to have to pull this now. This is looking super serious. So Unfortunately, all the cakes baked and everything, there wasn't anything we could do about it. And that was our first event that was cancelled. And within a week, we'd heard of pretty much every event organiser that we booked up through the whole year that it indeed was cancelled, all these events. In the meantime, because we hadn't booked up the whole year, I went to a local farm shop and I'd asked them if there was any chance that we could trade at the farm shop because they didn't have any coffee facilities and they were on board. Really, really interested in having us there. You know, we could have done the odd Saturday or Sunday and then done say a Wednesday and a Thursday or something to try and bulk the week out, we thought at the time. So it was really, really handy that we'd been and seen them because it actually gave us somewhere to go. Working at the farm shop has been absolutely fantastic and in many ways it really couldn't have worked any better. But unfortunately we had to apply for a street traders license. Because of the whole Covid situation it was really really hard getting that street traders license because there was never anybody working at the council. But we eventually managed to get it sorted out and we then started trading at the farm shop. In the meantime, before the farm shop, we'd actually started up a little internet business, selling our cakes online, and I used the van as a delivery van. It was amazing. There was no traffic on the roads at all. It was actually probably like driving around in the 1960s, in a 1960s van. And although we didn't really earn any money out of it, um, it was great fun and it gave me something to do and it kept the dream alive of course. Now I don't know why this is but for some reason every single road 
Wherever we go, whichever direction we turn in, is under construction. There's roadworks everywhere. Every single field, piece of green belt and floodplain is being played up and built on as well. We're not immune from this. It affects us greatly with our business. Wherever we drive, we've got to drive through endless amounts of temporary traffic lights to get to the food store that we use so we've got a local booker that we go to a seven minute journey now turns into a 45 minute journey and when we get there there's obviously supply chain problems with sugar and chocolate and things like that we can quite often get there and there not be the stock there that we wanted to buy online services are also hampered enormously because there are lots of strikes going on at the moment. Not only have they not got the food in stock, they can't actually deliver it to us anyway. A couple of years ago, they built a small housing estate on a field just up the road. They came to see us and they said, there's going to be temporary traffic lights for six weeks and it may affect your business. While well, those six weeks turn into 13 weeks, we soon found out how it affected our business because we didn't make any money for 13 weeks. Opposite the new housing estate, there is a field that is being currently ploughed up and another housing estate is springing up there. We have had it confirmed that there will be another nine months of roadworks along that road, possibly in 2023 or later. They have said that they are going to try and lessen the impact by doing the roadworks in a way that keeps the traffic flow moving. Now having a business on wheels, it's not totally inconceivable that we could just go and trade from another location. But having built up a growing, loyal and friendly customer base, we don't really want to do that. We'd also like to support the farm shop, of course, the petrol station down the road, we've attached car sales and mechanics bay, and the Swan pub across the road. There's all these businesses in this area that are going to suffer greatly, so we're going to try and do the best we can to keep going the way we are. So I think that pretty much wraps up everything I want to say about the business and hopefully you can begin to appreciate where I'm coming from when I said I wanted a happily ever story which isn't going to happen just yet. So this is why I finally got round to putting part 20 together. There are a few other things I'd like to say in relation to questions about the van. Do I have any regrets about what I did with the van? Would I do anything different? Yes, there are a few things I would have done differently, but I have very, very few regrets. The only real regret I have with the van is not rebuilding the gearbox because it is a little bit noisy in fifth. But there's nothing stopping me from rebuilding another gearbox in the future and I have sourced a 40,000 mile engine. That looks absolutely mint, no oil leaks on it anywhere. And I think the thing to do would be to get another gearbox, rebuild that, and then put it on that 40,000 mile engine and fit it in the van. And then I'll have a super low mileage engine and a nice quiet gearbox. And that's the plan for the future, like I say. That's the only real regret. I would have done things differently with the bodywork because I only really picked up the TIG welding as I was completing the welding on the van. There are different things I would have done with the rear wings particularly, but still no regrets because I did the best I could do at the time with the tools and the skills that I had at the time. Sliding doors. There are many, many thank yous that I could make, literally hundreds of people I could thank, but I'm not gonna go through them all. So a massive thanks to Hugh, who sent me a quick shift kit for a Type 9 gearbox. Thank you very much, Hugh. I mean, for somebody to just post me this after watching the video, and just saying, hey Trev, I think you could make use of these, I'm gonna post these to you, just absolutely blows me away. The other person I'd like to say huge thanks to is Andrew Thomas. Mentioned him before on the video channel, but without a doubt, Andrew's been the most amount of help out of everyone that's offered me any assistance. And Andrew contacted me way back in 2015 because I put a plea out on my video channel when I only had about probably 60 subscribers. And I was saying, look, if there's anybody out there that's done modifications to these Bedford Vans, uh, if you could uh, point me in the right direction, I'd be really appreciative. And I have been really appreciative, Andrew. 
he contacted me, I asked him a question, he flung himself under his van on a Sunday, took all these pictures from underneath his van and showed me what he'd done and unbelievable. Always overwhelmed by how people have put themselves out for somebody they don't really know, which is, um, which is really, really nice. And Andrew's an extremely clever chap. He's just completed his own disc brake conversion on his own Bedford CA and he kind of follows along really with my own personal philosophies. I mean, he, he built his own workshop, he, he bought a lathe, and then he's made these parts for his van. A lot of us enthusiasts, we haven't necessarily got the money and you have to do things yourself. If you want things done, you also get a satisfaction of doing it for yourself. Um, I've been just the same. I built this workshop, I got the planning for it in 2008 and so really this whole thing started in 2008 and it took me many many years to complete the garage because I didn't have a budget for it, I had no money at all, I literally saved up £100, I went off and bought a second hand cement mixer then I saved up another £100 and I bought some gravel and some cement started putting down the footings and the floor and everything else and I just went on and on like that and I've done exactly the same with the van. I jacked my job in and I didn't really have a budget for the van. I worked part time, I saved up the money that I was earning as I was working and I just, this is how I've done everything. So anyway, I've gone off the track slightly but Andrew, thank you very much. I really appreciate it and thanks very much for the Holly the Cafe Boat tip which is another fantastic YouTube channel. Vic and Joe have gone and bought themselves a narrow boat. Well, they live on a narrow boat and they bought themselves another one and turned it into a mobile cafe. So Andrew thought I'd be interested in seeing this. And damn right I am. And I also think that, hey, living on a narrow boat might not be such a bad thing to do in the future myself. Who knows what's gonna happen? So um, yeah, Andrew, thank you very much. I sincerely mean that and um, we'll keep in touch for sure. Whilst putting the final edits together for this video, I received some really shocking news. Hence the van's gone, the ending's changed, but I couldn't miss this opportunity just to say, get well soon, Chris, because Chris works alongside us at the farm shop. He and his wife, Hayley, run the cowshed garden and antiques. Chris had a really, really nasty head-on crash in his car and underwent a 10-hour operation really really badly injured but he's going to be okay and we can't wait to get you back Chris. Chris is a larger than life character, banter on another level, basically he just goes around taking the piss out of absolutely everyone and all you can hear is him chuckling and laughing while he does this. We can't wait to hear that chuckle and laugh again and this just echoes what I was saying earlier about not having any regrets with what I've done. I really really have no regrets and as I was kind of hinting towards back in 2008, building this workshop, all this has come about because I actually set in motion that. I didn't have the budget, I didn't have the time, I didn't have a lot of the skills that I've got now, but what I had was some long-term perspective and I think that's what you've got to have when you haven't got a lot. You've just got to set that ship in motion, aim it where you want to get to, and unfortunately, time has got to pass. I keep saying in my videos, the best tool you've got in your toolbox is your patience. And of course, little did I know back in 2008, whilst starting this workshop, I would be approached by people like Rob from Extreme Plasma. Now Rob's given me a plasma table. He's helped me out enormously. He's always a great ear for advice. And I really, really, truly do appreciate your contact and your friendship, Rob. And we hope to do more things together in the future. And I've also, of course, been helped out by Artec Welding Equipment and more recently, Rust Buster. And not forgetting, of course, Chris Cadle from Outline Displays who helped me build this amazing tube neon sign. We've also made cracking friends within the cafe trade. Our great friends Julie and Steve from Biblin's Tea Gardens in the Forest of Dean who helped us out enormously setting up our business and we're always trading coffee shop tips and tricks together.
Sliding doors! <laughs> Well, I really hope you've enjoyed part 20. I know that many of you have enjoyed the series overall because you've come to see us at the farm shop whilst we've been trading with the van. People have taken detours off their holidays and things like that to actually come and see us with Betty the Bedford and myself and Birdie. And if you'd like to continue that journey, you can follow us on the Baking Bird YouTube channel. There is a link in the video description to the channel. And I'm also gonna put links to anything else that I've mentioned within this video. So I will say, before I go, briefly, I really appreciate all your comments, your contacts, your thumbs ups, and everything else that you give you guys. And um, until next time round, I shall say, Bye for now. Today I'm going to clean the van off. I try and do it every week through the winter. I have to do it every week through the winter because those country lanes we drive down only has to get a little bit wet and it sprays all over it. Also they've been gritting the roads as well so I also swill it under the arches and anywhere that that spray is going to spray up underneath. Try and hold back the inevitable um, and I also give it a wax as well every month to every six weeks, which keeps it in really good order. Through the summer, we can often get away with not washing the van for two, two, maybe even three weeks, three weeks in an absolute stretch because we do like to keep it looking really nice. I've been feeling so small Watch the clock ticking off the wall that I drew on the back of an envelope of how I wanted the labels to look so I drew it for Trevor to hopefully make some stickers up with and he's done a pretty good job I think. <laughs>